So first and foremost, I want to welcome everybody to today's webinar. Uh, welcome. It is the Nevada Realtors fifth eviction webinar that we're hosting. Thank you all for joining us. We sincerely appreciate it. My name is Marissa Lastra and I am your Nevada Realtors 2020 treasurer. As most of you know, Nevada Realtors has been working tirelessly to bring you the property managers the latest and best information on landlord and tenant issues that we're all facing as we navigate this COVID crisis. The previous four webinars can be found on Nevada Realtors YouTube channel, on the website of the Nevada Realtors Facebook page, in the weekly Nevada Realtors e-news, which comes out every Monday, and we'll also be recording and posting today's webinar. Today's webinar, we're going to focus on rental relief programs. The first half of the program will have a presentation by the Nevada State Treasurer, Mr. Zach Cobine. And then I'd ask that you all please stay logged on and tuned in to hear a really important development uh, that's recently come up regarding the lease addendum form that we have some critical new information about and it's just been released and we would like to share that with you. So right now I would like to please welcome Mrs. Molly Hamrick who has served as the chair of Nevada Realtors Property Management Presidential Advisory Group. Molly? Hi, good afternoon. Thanks Marissa for that introduction. As Marissa said, I'm the uh, chair for our Property Management Presidential Presidential Advisory Group um, have been serving in that position since this all started in mid-March and I have enjoyed most every moment, but not all of them, but most of them. And uh, thank you. I just want to thank everybody for joining us today. We've got again over 200, which lets you know how important this topic is uh, for Nevada and for our businesses and for the uh, tenants and the landlords as well. Um, and I wanted to thank uh, Treasurer Zach Conine for joining us today as he explains the rental assistance program. We also have uh, Danielle Gallant with us as well. She has served in the PAG um, and has been with us along this path as well. Um, so Treasurer Conine has worked with the Nevada Realtors through this pandemic and sought out, to, um, we've sought out his input um, on the relief programs and he's going to take the first 10 minutes, as Marissa said, to, roll, to kind of give you an idea of the background of the programs and how they work. And then we're gonna have 20 minutes of Q&A. And as Marissa stated earlier as well, there are quite a few uh, updates coming uh, down in terms of the addendum. And so please make sure you stay on. And then the chat is open too. Um, I know I attended both, or I watched the webinars three and four, and I had a lot of questions from those webinars. They were really based more on commercial. Um, so I know as Zach, as uh, Treasurer Conan is rolling out this uh, program, you'll have a lot of questions too. So make sure you put them in the, in the chat and we'll get to you as they come through. With that said, Treasurer Conine, welcome. Thanks, Molly, and thanks for the introduction. Uh, happy to be here. You know, the Realtors have been an exceptional resource as we work through uh, our piece of the puzzle, which is economic recovery, making sure that we can keep people in their homes, make sure businesses can stay open, uh, and then we can get back on our feet as quickly as possible. So for those of you who don't know me, I am Zach Conine. I'm your Nevada State Treasurer, uh, the 23rd Treasurer of the great state of Nevada. Uh, and again, just in real quick background, the Treasurer serves as the Chief Investment Officer of the state. You have six constitutional offices, the Governor, the Lieutenant Governor, the Attorney General, uh, the Secretary of State, and then the Treasurer and the Controller. The Controller serves as the Accountant for the state, and I'm the Investor. So on any given day, we manage about $3 billion directly of state money and about $25 billion of individual investments in education-focused retirement plans. Our office also manages something called unclaimed property, which is kind of fun and always happy to talk about that later on, uh, as well as the Governor Gwynn Millennium Scholarship, the College 529 plans, Nevada prepaid tuition, College Kickstart, and a host of other education, higher education focused components. But in this role, what we really wanted to do was step in and try to find pieces of the economic side. Now we weren't involved at all and aren't involved at all in the health side, which should make you all feel generally comfortable since I have absolutely no background in public health. Uh, but we do know a fair bit about economics and we know a fair bit about leases. In my private life prior to this, uh, I was a director of operations for a low property downtown called the Gold Nugget. And we opened up uh, the downtown Grand and I've opened about 28 or 29 restaurants in my career. So familiar with all sorts of different kinds of leases. When we looked back at the last recession, uh, what we realized was that a lot of that was caused by housing instability, right? So the desire for banks, mortgage companies, credit unions, et cetera, to get that housing inventory back in the market led to a rush of foreclosures, which then of course, as you all know better than most, led to that shadow inventory problem, right? Where there were more houses for sale than were actually on the market which screwed around with house values. And then of course, as housing values fell, uh, more people ended up underwater, which removed a lot of the standard workout opportunities. And 
um, it, it created a property tax issue, which we're still dealing with on the state side when it comes to paying for services. So our role in this process has been to look for ways that we can remove overhangs for Nevada families and make sure that that economic recovery is again, as quick and as strong as possible. To that end, uh, we started looking at some of the dollars available from your federal delegation. Uh, a bill was passed in late March called the CARES Act, uh, which I'm sure many of you have heard about, right? That's where the pandemic unemployment assistance comes from, the FPOC, which is the additional $600 a week, et cetera, et cetera, right? A big, big bill. Part of that was a $1.25 billion allocation to the state of Nevada, some of which went to Clark County and uh, the city of Las Vegas, but $836 million stayed at the, city, at the state level for response and recovery actions. We have allocated $50 million of that 836 to residential and commercial rental relief, $30 million to residential rental relief at the state level, as well as $20 million on commercial rental relief. We're gonna spend most of our time talking about residential today, but happy to answer any questions about the commercial program, which should roll out somewhere between four and five weeks from today. Our $20 million for commercial rental relief uh, $30 million, excuse me, for residential rental relief is being split $20 million for Clark County and $10 million for uh, the rurals in Reno combined, uh, five and five each. The Clark County portion is going in addition to $30 million of Clark's money, so there's about $50 million uh, of Clark County money available in the rental relief program for residential, about $10 million available through the rest of the state. Folks who are looking to uh, find out more about those programs can go to housing.nv.gov, and I'll put this in the chat or one of my team could if you would, uh, housing.nv.gov, that's the landing page at the state level, and that'll point you to different resources, uh, both for landlords and for um, tenants uh, and for homeowners, right? So it's kind of a good centralized place to look for. The basic tenants of the residential relief program are as follows. It's available to people who are back in their rent. It's not available for people who haven't gone back in their rent yet. So if you've been able to make the payments, um, then once you get behind, if you get behind in the future, that's when you would apply for the program. It's limited to individuals who are at 120% or less of area median income, um, which just to scope it for you, if it's a single person in the residence in Clark County, that's about 60 grand a year. Uh, four people in a household, that's about 90 grand a year. So you gotta be under that level. And we're looking at most recent. So if you made a bunch of money last year, but then lost your job this year, you would qualify for that program. Uh, you also need less than $3,000 in liquid assets. So, you know, cash in the bank. Um, big thing there is we wanna make sure the resources go to the people who need them the most. So all in all, uh, that's how the program works. We're paying back rent. In Clark County, we're working with uh, 13 uh, community partners, um, the Hope Links, uh, Help of Southern Nevada, et cetera, et cetera, groups that are out there in the community who help uh, to process applications and make sure that this money can go out to folks as quickly as possible. That's the basics of the program. I could talk about it forever, but I found it's usually easier just to take questions. Um, and I see some questions coming in on the sideboard. Happy to take those or uh, whichever you'd prefer, Molly. Super, thank you for that backdrop. Um, yeah, there's a lot of questions coming in pretty quickly. I've got one um, that I wanted to start with as well uh, that came in earlier. And um, if a tenant has been non-responsive and has not paid their rent for a few months, despite the owner reaching out to the tenant for the residential rental assistance program, can the owner submit for the missing rent payments if the tenant does not respond to the owner, nor if the tenant applies to this program? No, so that it's got to be tenant applied for. Now, the money goes directly to the landlords. We wanted to make sure that the money was going uh, to the landlords as opposed to going to the tenant just from a diversion perspective and also to make sure that the uh, program did what we wanted the program to do. But the tenant has to apply because it's the tenant's income that controls eligibility. And the second part of that, pro that question is, what if the owners have or have not applied for any of the assistance from the uh, COVID uh, and the CARES Act? And this is uh, the owners like the, the tenant or the landlord? Landlord. Landlord. So if the landlords applied for assistance from uh, that program, that's great. They should. Uh, a lot of landlords could be eligible for PPP or uh, EIDL loans through the Small Business Administration or a series of other things. This is about the tenant. So as long as the tenant uh, is eligible for the program, then the landlord can receive the funds. Super. That clarifies that. Thank you. And I know, Danielle, you had a couple of questions that came in previously as well. Did you want to ask those now? 
If you're on mute. Sorry. No <laughs> All right. So, um, so somebody just um, submitted a question. Um, does the assistance only apply for people who are currently in arrears? Will it apply to people who begin um, being behind on rent starting in August? So I think you partially answered that question. However, um, I think it might be nice to maybe go into detail with that because some people have just recently lost their jobs. You know, for instance, Boyd uh, Gamey just issued a whole bunch of um, uh, letters as well. So if you wouldn't mind. Yeah, absolutely. So uh, in its current incarnation, this is a backward looking program. These are is for individuals who are currently in arrears. We know there are gonna be more people that end up in arrears uh, in short term due to either additional job losses like the ones uh, that you just stated or uh, because the additional uh, $600 from the federal government is due to expire actually tomorrow. Um, so there'll be one more week of those payments. Uh, we know that more people are gonna need access to the program can access it now. The first tranche, that first money is supposed to go to individuals who are already behind, right? Already in the hole, get them and their landlords caught up. Uh, and then we know there's gonna be additional resources needed down the road. And I think that's an important point to make here. $50 million does not fix this problem. It's a great start, right? Uh, but it doesn't fix the problem. And one of the things that we have been trying to do here is get a pipeline uh, in place, get mechanics that work so that if additional resources do come from the federal government, we have a way to quickly get them on the street, right? Um, but, you know, the, the amount of money that we have for this program uh, is not enough to deal with the entire size of the problem. Period. And what, would it, what is the date that you guys are considering arrears? Because I've had some tenants be able to pay, you know, a lot of us have, and then all of a sudden in July, they're not able to pay. Yeah, so currently, right? So if the tenant can okay. show that they're behind and didn't pay July rent, um, they would be eligible for the program. It, but you can't be okay. in arrears, obviously, in the future. So it's immediate, sure. arrears, right? If you're, um, and we have some tenants who are applying who are partially in arrears, right? They've been making payments each month, but they haven't been making the entire payment. That would be okay yeah. to do. Okay. Super, thank you. We've got a few more questions that came in and, and one that, that popped into my mind just from the previous webinars um, was how the dollars are, 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 are allocated and, and, and approved. If, if the owner is working with the tenant, the landlord's working with the tenant to get those back dollars that they have back property taxes or other things that are due, how, how is that treated? So again, it's specifically for rent during uh, this, this time period, I'll apologize if there's a noise. I can hear my three-year-old trying to get into the room. This might end up being like that BBC <laughs> situation. Uh, I don't know which three-year-old, which of the twins, but they're both loud, so something to look forward to. <laughs> um, so we're really focused on rent. Now, the program is paid for with CARES dollars. Because it's paid for with CARES dollars, we can't do things like pay property tax, right? So CRF dollars, Coronavirus Relief Fund dollars, which is a component of the CARES Act, that $1.25 billion is specifically... Uh, restricted and what you can use it for. One of the things you can't use it for is revenue replacement. So if we pay property taxes or like, you know, property taxes are specifically called out, uh, we aren't able to pay those using CRF funds. Super. One of the other questions was, um, my tenant was turned down because they do not file tax returns. What do they do if they are too poor to file IRS taxes every year? How do they get relief? So they're going to have to prove income and uh, proof of income can come through a number of different ways. I suggest they work uh, with the specific providers to do that, but we need to be able to prove income one way or another in order to make sure they're eligible for the program. Additionally, there are other federal programs in place that people might be taking advantage of now um, that because of the fact that we can't overlap those federal dollars could make them ineligible for this program. But if they're ineligible for this because of that reason, they should be eligible for another type of relief. Super, and then we're getting a lot of questions as where does the tenant go um, to apply for these programs? And we had chatted about that earlier uh, before the call. I know there's FAQs out there and there's a lot of information out there. And so not only where does the tenant go, but the 200 plus property managers that are on this call, where do they go? to find that information so they can push that out to both the landlords and the tenants. Absolutely, so if people scroll up in the chat, uh, they'll see a post uh, at uh, 112 from Eric Jimenez that directs people to a uh, one-pager on where to go uh, in English. We also have those in 
uh, a series of other languages so we can we can post those up. Um, the easiest website to go to is housing.nv.gov. That's housing, one word, dot nv, Nevada, nv, dot gov. Uh, and that'll bring you to the housing division's main page, which then has links to the different programs. Folks in Reno, for instance, are gonna go uh, to the Reno Housing Authority to apply, but you can just go to housing.nv.gov and then click through to Reno. In the rurals, it's the Nevada Rural Housing Authority. And like I said, in Clark, it's a combination of 13 different community partners, uh, most of whom are taking inbound phone calls as opposed to online. In Reno, in the rurals, uh, it's an online uh, portal. And will those 13 partners be on your uh, your website that you just called out? Yep, they're all there. What you'll end up doing on that is you'll click through. When you click on the housing page, you'll see uh, there's different links for homeowners and renters and uh, landlords. You click through as a renter, and it'll bring up the three uh, county areas you can pick. You pick Clark Counties, and that'll go to their uh, page, which is, and I always get this wrong, I believe it's helphopehome.org. Um, but... Don't That's over. correct. Use, use the links. That is correct. Help hey, you, home .org. you got it right. <laughs> 20 times the charm, right, Molly? That's right. <laughs> we always get better. Um, another question was, if they are receiving housing choice benefits and lost income, are they eligible? Uh, it depends on the specific program that they're getting access to. Uh, I don't want to speak for housing choice specifically, but that sounds like one of the federal programs that might have an overlap that doesn't work. Uh, with these dollars, uh, but if an individual is getting unemployment insurance or PUA or something else, uh, we'll look at the income with the PUA with the unemployment ins insurance. So if the if that puts you over the line, uh, then you wouldn't be eligible until those programs ran out or until some other piece of your income went away uh, or vice versa. But just to scope it, um, right now the most someone can be getting for unemployment insurance in the state of Nevada is around fifty-two thousand dollars a year. Um, so unless you have multiple uh, renters under the same roof with the same lease who are receiving those benefits, you should fall under any applicable uh, median income caps. Super, thank you. Um, pretty simple question, but I know it can be a complex answer. Where do tenants, or um, how do you prove lack of income? Well, so we prove lack of income in a number of different ways. There's a certification process. Obviously, taxes are the easiest um, because if you file taxes and we can see it. Uh, but we'll also ask for pay scales and stubs and the rest. Really, you want the tenant to be able to show some level of uh, either income or lack thereof through some sort of filed document that's already happened. It's difficult when somebody comes into one of these community partners, just from a fraud perspective, if they have no income, have never filed taxes, have no relationship with the federal government, uh, it's tough for us to kind of know who they are. Um, but a lot of individuals, uh, just so you know, have gone through this process recently, either filing tax returns or filing um, kind of the no return necessary to get that $1,200 uh, federal stimulus, right? So a lot of that information can be used as well. Super. Um, and then what docs do they actually need when they apply? Uh, so there's a great list of those documents available on the website um, or on that housing uh, page. Um, you know, there's some eligibility information and then depending on who the partner is, they'll take you through that process uh, directly. Um, most of the documents are the same, but it's, it can be different based on the provider. Uh, and the order in which they're provided is almost always different by provider. Okay. And is that's all live? Resource? Sorry, Molly. Go ahead. Uh, is there any resources for tenants that don't have internet, don't have a computer, don't have a smartphone, phone, phone number, um, a way we can fax in those documents for them? Absolutely. So first off, everybody can call uh, 211, which is the informational program set up by the state so they can call 211, get access to either the phone number for the Reno Housing Authority or the Rural Housing Authority or Clark County or one of those partners uh, if need be. Um, but we'll also share, uh, and it's on the website, you can all share and, and landlords can print out a list of the phone numbers. Uh, most of the Clark County um, agencies are dealing primarily on the phone uh, and then switching over to a form of data collection as opposed to taking all the data in on the front end and then getting people on the phone. Um, so it's a very interactive process, at least on the front end. Super, that's a great question, Danielle. And, and Treasure, are, is the, the online service, is that both in English and Spanish? Uh, it depends on the provider. Some have English resources, some don't. Uh, but from a rural and Reno standpoint where you're actually applying online, um, those can be available in Spanish. And if anybody has a problem, they can always reach out uh, and there are Spanish speakers at each of the 
uh, certainly each of the state agencies, the, re the housing authorities, Clark County as well, and a number of the providers. Super. Next question was, how does this affect the tenant that is receiving the PUA, PUA? Uh, shouldn't really at all. I mean, separate systems um, to the extent that someone is receiving PUA and perhaps they have some other source of income in their household uh, and that then puts them over the income cap, then they'd be over the income cap, but that would really be the only connection. Um, there is no eligibility issue with or without PUA or UI or any other sort of program, unless it's specifically federal housing relief. Okay, and the second part to that question was, um, does receiving assistance reduce the tenant's PUA weekly claim? No. It wouldn't affect it? No, no not related. Okay. These are grants as opposed to loans. They don't count as income, right? It's a, it's, they fall under the aid grant uh, piece of a, uh, this isn't gonna show up on a tax return. How about that? That's great. Uh, did we have any other questions? I think I ran through the ones that I saw in the chat or if there's anything else, uh, Treasurer, that you wanted to add that perhaps we, we have missed or that have come up in previous sessions? Uh, no, happy to answer any questions. I see a bunch are coming in on the right. Uh, but again, I just want to encourage everybody to go to uh, housing.nv.gov for resources. If there are other resources that you see that you'd like to see up there, let us know and we can make sure those get added, right? We want it to be as effective as possible for everybody. In addition, if anyone's having a specific problem after they go through those resources, don't hesitate to email our office and that's ask at nevadatreasurer.gov and I'll put that in the... Uh, uh, in the chat right now, but it's ask at nevadatreasurer.gov. My staff loves it when I give that email address out, so please feel free to email us. And you also clarified that all those links are, are live, and we and I do have one other question that was, was kind of long, so I'm going to run through this for you. Um, it says, continuation on forbearance. FHA is currently the only forbearance that gets tacked on the back end of the loan. The other programs, VA and conventional, the amount not paid is spread out over 12 months in addition to their mortgage payment and the deficient impound accounts. This will raise a normal owner to DTI to over 60 to 65% DTI and make the housing unaffordable. This is also the case with landlords that ask for forbearance on their loans while the tenants were not paying. Remember, these are retirees that may lose their retirement income from the rental program. What is the state doing to look into this challenge? Yeah, it's a, it's a great question. I think that was from Aldo. Uh, it's, a, it's a great question. Right. Um, the state doesn't have control, obviously, over what FHA does uh, or what banks or credit unions or mortgage companies are doing on uh, the back side of forbearance. I can tell you we've worked with banks, credit unions, um, a mortgage servicers since the beginning of this crisis. And for the most part, uh, they've been reasonable, good actors. I think everyone realizes that uh, what we did during 2008, 9, 10, 11 is not what we should ever do again. Right. And that ended up being both bad from our economics and also from the economics of the individual banks and the other uh, folks who held those notes. Um, so I know that is a conversation, right? So what those different solutions are for someone who has, uh, who has put their, um, their mortgage into forbearance. We've seen uh, a combination of ideas, both the put a couple of months on the back uh, of a thing, a 12 or 24 or 36 month uh, payoff, kind of an accelerated note. Um, some of the banks are using what is effectively a, a rider, um, like a note rider, so an addendum, a, a lump of money um, that actually doesn't have an interest rate attached to it and doesn't have principal payments attached to it, but gets settled up when the house transacts down the road, right? So when there's a sale or a change of ownership, right, that, that note gets paid off. Um, I thought that was sort of an elegant solution. But I think, you know, to the extent that people are looking for ways that that could work. They should reach out to their banks, talk to the banks about the number of options available. And of course, that's going to be different for your conventional, your FHA. Um, Freddie and Fannie are doing slightly different things on those backend notes. So that level of communication is going to be important. I also think it's likely to be something we see in future federal legislation on the topic, um, just like that first forbearance extension was. Molly, I think this question came in that's really um, a good question is, um, are they still taking applications from tenants for the rental assistance or the funds already been allocated? Per the newspaper, it says the tenants were unable to put in applications as full. Yeah, I don't know. 
this is Zach. I'm not sure what newspaper that is, uh, but there are still funds available. Okay. Super. I would also um, suggest just from a, a tenant perspective, because it's a collection of partners uh, down in Clark County, um, if you run into one that is backed up or perhaps has too many people in the queue in front of you, you certainly should feel free to call around to others uh, and find one that maybe has availability uh, before you. Much like the federal PPP program, some banks were just able to process more quickly than other banks. So one of the things we're looking at is which of those partners is able to get through their queue, get money on the streets as quickly as possible, and we'll backfill them with additional funds because they're able to get through the uh, uh, through the timeline quickly. So Treasurer, in your magic math, do you have an idea of what that looks like from a backflow? How many dollars are out there that are needed? We know 50 yeah. million is not enough, but do we have an idea of what it looks like? Yeah, it depends on which study you want to look at. I mean, I, I typically really appreciate the work the Gwynn Center put out. They had a number um, in the 230 plus million dollar range. Um, I think there are a lot of unknowns, right? So uh, whether or not the federal government provides additional stimulus dollars that go into extending that $600 a week uh, or some version of it, unemployment piece is a huge component. There are plenty of Nevadans who are able to pay their rent uh, and get through the day with that assistance who won't be able to get through the day uh, with their standard $400 a week um, unemployment benefit, right? That's a, that's a massive cut. Um, from what people have been able to use so far. And that's obviously been helping us to prop up the economy. Um, you know, our goal is to make sure that we get all these funds out to people who need them quickly. And then we go secure more uh, once we have a pipeline that works, right? And if we find ourselves with uh, additional funds, there have certainly been programs that have spun up around uh, the country that haven't been as successful because they were uh, either had too many restrictions around them or uh, were for too small a subset of people uh, or whatever. Um, then we'll adjust the program and make sure we, we get that money out. I can assure you we're going to spend all 50. All 50 quickly, um, especially because 20 vets going to go, uh, go commercial as well. So we know, we know the state of Nevada needs those dollars, and we appreciate you uh, fighting for them and helping us allocate them for sure. Well, I think that answers all of the questions. Oh, no, we still have a few more coming in. They keep coming in. So how long uh, does the process take and how quickly do they receive the funds? Uh, so the process, we believe funds are going to start going out from some of the partners as early as Monday or Tuesday of next week. Um, it really depends on how quickly the information can get in, how correct the information is, and how quickly the partner is able to move. So we expect some funds will start to go out next week. We expect more funds will go out at the end of next week. I think a good back of the napkin is about 14 days after uh, the application is approved, but some are going to be much quicker and some are going to be uh, slower just based on the nature of the, the beast. And I, I certainly can suggest, while well, people could call multiple partners to try and get uh, in a good place in the queue in order to get their application processed, don't file multiple applications because the way the system is set up, if a tenant files multiple applications on the same lease, it's just going to blow them all out um, and they won't get access to any of those applications. It'll just totally gum up the project. Um, so definitely recommend to people that they don't do that. Get to the point of filing an application, but don't file more than one. That's and super it, once important. A, once the tenant applies for an application, what kind of communication can they expect confirming that? It depends on the partner, but uh, it should be a relatively open line of communication um, to get make sure all the information is in. And once all the information is in, assuming that they're eligible for the program, they will receive the dollars until we run out of funds. There isn't a, a prioritization within people who have applied. Uh, it's first come, first serve. So once you've turned in all your application pieces, if you are eligible for the program, which again is why I want to encourage people not to apply with two partners because that would make them ineligible for the program. Uh, but if you are eligible and you turn in all your information, you're going to get funds until we run out. Super. Great. Thank one you. last question. Yes, thank you, Danielle. One last question that came in again was when filing for the weekly certification for PUA, some of the questions are, whoa, it just dropped down. Where did this go? I can see it. Oh, there we are. Um, have you applied or received any money from a source? And then you have to disclose that. So you have to disclose the source. Yeah, I, I don't want to get over my skis here in the treasury. I'm a lawyer, but not that kind of lawyer. 
um, I suggest they reach out to uh, resources, legal aid and otherwise, um, to make sure they're staying on the right side of the Department of Labor guidelines. That's a federal thing and, you know, supremacy clause and all, I try not to opine. Um, I see there's also a question in there about uh, Clark County versus Washoe. Washoe is starting with $5 million. Uh, and if we find that the need in Washoe is greater than the need in Clark, we'll shift funds from one to the other and vice versa. Super. And Treasurer Cornyn, you mentioned a great source, and that's legal aid. And so we point a lot of our tenants and landlords to legal aid. That's a very, very good source um, for you guys to point your tenants and your landlords to. They have some really, really good support there. Um, Aldo had another question coming in, and he states, can a landlord find out if their tenant is applying for the assistance? Yeah, so uh, Aldo, great question. Um, yeah. The payments in this are paid directly to the landlord, not to the tenant. So if a uh, tenant applies, the landlord has to sign a certification that effectively says, I'm taking these dollars in on behalf of the tenant. So we don't have any slippage between, say, a fund uh, or funds going to the landlord, but the landlord not knowing which tenant is applied or anything like that, right? So it's a, we try to match up the two sides. Um, and then I see your, your comment on the people receiving PUA, banking the money and not paying the landlords. I, I'm sure that's happening. I don't think that's happening a lot. I'm sure that's happening. Uh, but to the extent that it is, it won't be happening through this program because that money is going to go directly uh, to the landlords. Additionally, there's an eligibility uh, restriction. So if someone has more than $3,000 worth of uh, liquid assets, which would be, say, like that banked money from PUA, um, then you know, they wouldn't be eligible for this program. And that's an important point that the money, while the, the tenant is applying for the money, those dollars do go directly to the landlord. So we need to make sure that the tenants recognize that as well. Um, and I'm sure that's part of the FAQs that you'll find online. Another question that came in is, can owners reject a rental applicant who is using rental assistance or unemployment as income? Again, I, I think that's a legal question. I, I guess the, uh, I would ask why, um, right? Money's money. Uh, and I think especially during these times, I would really hope that Nevadans would look out for each other and not discriminate based on where income is coming from. That might just be Zach talking, um, but I think that'd be a great question for a lawyer. And good input from a uh, treasurer. Uh, this question, I don't know if this is something that you can answer or not, but how do we as property managers handle the tenant's claim where the owner lives out of the country and have our broker managing their property? That's a great question. Um, I think it'll come down to what sort of power of attorney uh, the property manager has, right? Can they enter into agreements? Can they not enter into agreements? Um, and I would work with uh, whoever the aid source was at the time. And, and Clark County, for instance, if you're in Clark County, is managing the, the landlord piece. Um, but I would encourage your tenants to apply. And then when it gets to that stage, uh, we might have to figure out the paperwork side. Super. Did I get it all? Do we have one more? Did one more sneak in here? If a, what if a landlord has a property manager that collects rent on their behalf? Will funds go to the owner or the property manager? Great question. It goes back to agency and power of attorney, right? So if those funds, if the uh, property manager is able to, for instance, collect uh, receipts on behalf of the landlord and the landlord signs off on that, I wouldn't see it being a problem. Awesome. Well, we really appreciate your time today and the questions have been fabulous. Uh, remember to include your email because we will uh, be forwarding back any answers to questions that we did not get to. I think we got to them all, but we might have missed one here or there. Um, so Treasurer Conan, we really, really appreciate your time and all the work you're doing for everybody, uh, staying safe and healthy and obviously as much as we can keep them in their properties here in the state of Nevada. I know it's a very, very big undertaking and you've done a fabulous job. But we appreciate that. I appreciate that. And I appreciate all the feedback uh, and the information and the questions uh, and all of your help in getting the word out to folks. I, one more question from uh, Stephen Goldman. The question is what months are eligible to get paid for? Um, so under the CARES Act, we can't use the dollars for any period uh, before March 1st. Um, so the period of March 1st, and then um, that can go until we run out of money uh, or until December 30th, which is the current expiration date of those CARES dollars. So that's a good window to think about on that front. Uh, again, thank you so much for having me. Thanks for the work you're doing. Uh, and for those of you up in Reno, don't forget to wash your hands. <laughs> but a pain. So thank you very much. Everybody, please stay on because I am going to introduce our state executive officer, Teresa McKee. She's going to talk to us a little bit about uh, the, uh, the addendum that we've been speaking on and uh, the status of evictions and whatnot. So Teresa. 
Thank you, Molly. Um, and wow, that was that was just great. We're so fortunate to have people like uh, the treasurer and and some of the judges we've had on and um, the attorney general's office on these webinars. Uh, we're getting great attendance and we thank all of you for tuning in. Um, this issue really just that I'm going to talk about just really came up last night. So we have not been able to fully process it. But the potential that this may affect you and the uh, lease addendum that you're using and your eviction process, um, there, there may be a, a huge effect on you. So I just want to uh, talk to you all about staying tuned for more information. And um, what it's in regard to our, is a mediation program. The courts currently have uh, some courts, some district courts, some justice courts have eviction mediation programs, um, but there's a big push by the Supreme Court, by access to justice, by legal aid to increase the mediations in response to what they think will be a flood of evictions starting September 1st. We don't know, um, you know, we've talked to the judges that, that have been involved with us who have not been really worried about having a, a huge um, overflow or having any delays, but some recent studies that came out show that there could be a very significant um, run on evictions and, and flood the court system. They're putting this um, court discretion mediation program probably in place, probably soon, um, probably by October 1st, and we're working with the judges to um, to talk about the, the lease addendum because the lease addendum is kind of like you're mediating already. You're coming to an agreement with that tenant um, for repayment of arrears. And if they pay, fine, you don't evict. But if they don't pay, then you have the right to evict them on that or if they don't pay their regular rent. So if they default on your lease addendum, um, do you have to go back through mediation? Because you've already come to an agreement, why would you go back through mediation just to do the same thing that they already said they were going to do and didn't do? So we are working through that issue on how these programs may affect you, um, whether they're going to be mandatory or voluntary. Um, the, it's anticipated that the mediation program would be paid for through CARES Act funds, but we don't have a lot of answers. We just have a lot of questions so far, but I, I think it's really important that you all stay tuned. We will do another webinar as soon as we get enough information to give you some good advice on how to proceed. Um, you know, We still encourage you to work with the tenants. That's the best option. Work with the tenants to avoid evicting at all if you can. And we know there's some tenants that, that just are unable to pay, uh, you just can't work with them. There's uh, leases that expire. There's all kinds of circumstances, um, but it, we could be, be faced with some critical information from the courts about uh, a mediation program that the judges may have to use. Um, it's, it was explained to us by Supreme Court Justice Hardesty that you, know, you can go into this mediation program, but if the mediation program is not there, you're going to have to wait until the court calendar clears so they can hear your case. And if you're on a two or three month backlog um, to get through, doesn't it make more sense to flush out some of those through a mediation through agreements rather than having everybody wait so the court can do that same process. So at this point, um, I don't know if Tiffany has anything else to add. Uh, we're working on it. We're trying to get better information so we can advise you better, but please stay tuned. Tiffany, did you have anything? No, oh, I think you explained it perfect. Okay, I think, so that's biggest, thing, I think our biggest thing that we want to figure out is if the mediation would be required or allowable for just the non-payment of rents or for all evictions. I think that's a really important piece because if they just say everything under Chapter 40, that has a different impact than just the limited non-payment of rent. And while you were talking, I just had an idea. Maybe there's a way to craft some language that um, says if they entered into the suggested lease addendum and promissory note, they agree to forego mediation. So because that came out of the governor's directive, maybe there's a way to say, like you said previously, then they've agreed that was their mediation. So we can talk about that. Yeah. Yeah. I like maybe that. Another, angle. Yeah. So, uh, you know, maybe sort of um, splitting the baby might be a good approach in terms of if they 
fall behind on their arrearage payments and have signed that addendum, maybe that's already considered mediated. But if they fall short on their current rents, if we have to have some type of negotiations, that maybe then if they're pushing for us to have mediation, that maybe it's just on the current month's rent. Right. And we don't know if we'll have any input into this because this is a court rule system. Um, and, and there is, I think, a certain amount of public um, input that can be given. Um, so again, just stay tuned. It's, it's a fresh <laughs> topic that we just haven't had time to fully process, but we'll try to get that out through our, all of our channels and um, get you information about how we can respond. And again, if you have questions or if you just want to follow up, um, any questions about evictions, you can send through the legal information line, info line at nvrealtors.org. Um, Tiffany and Crystal are doing a great job of, of handling all of those questions. Um, we have all of our information is up on the website, on YouTube, on um, in our e-news. So, you know, please just look for those resources and uh, we look forward to the next webinar as soon as we have enough to, to talk about. So, and, and I would just like to add, we are encouraging you to still enter into those lease addendums. It just might be, we tell you in a couple of weeks or a month, you're going to have to add some additional language, but please still work with your tenants and your landlords on entering into those agreements. Yeah, it's very important that we continue to press those forward and acting as if until something changes, because as we know, there's a, one consistent thing in today's world is a lot of change on a regular basis. So. Um, we want to make sure that we're, we're entering into those agreements. If you've got any questions, reach out to uh, the hotline. They've been great. Crystal and, and Tiffany have been fabulous on keeping all of us informed and answering those questions very, very quickly. Um, and then remember, too, to, to look at housing.nevada.gov and uh, get those FAQs. I always say that we can only advocate if we've got educated people. So you want to make sure that your tenants and your landlords are as educated as possible so that we can help them uh, make the best decision for their situation. Um, the goal, obviously, is everybody's health and safety and keeping people in properties as much as possible um, when it is possible. So there's a lot of uncertainty out there. We have to recognize that um, and trying to manage through that. And you guys are doing a great job as property managers. I'm very proud of Nevada and keeping everybody moving forward. Um, continue to lead with empathy and with uh, intelligence and knowledge and uh, doing the great job that you're doing. So I'm sure we'll see you guys again real soon with the updates uh, that's coming down from uh, the eviction uh, processes as well. So thank you for joining us. And if people miss this, please push out the link to them as well. Thank you.